If you chose C as the answer to the warm-up question, then you are correct. The two objects must be traveling in the same direction in order for them to have the same non-zero linear momentum vector P. The other three statements, A, B, and C, are not always absolutely true, particularly if the objects have different masses and different velocities. And we can explore this through the following statements. Let's assume that I have two objects, object A and object B. And for each object, I write mathematical expressions for their linear momentum vectors and their translational kinetic energies. For object A, the linear momentum vector for object A is simply equal to its mass times its velocity vector, and its translational kinetic energy is one half its mass times its speed squared. The same for object B. It has a linear momentum vector described by its mass and its velocity vector V sub B, and its translational kinetic energy is just one half its mass times its speed squared. The condition we want to impose on this particular question is that both object A and object B have the exact same non-zero linear momentum vectors. The linear momentum of object A equals the linear momentum of object B, but they are non-zero. Even though both objects could have the same mass and the same velocity and have the same non-zero linear momentum vector, it turns out that doesn't always have to be the case. Object A and object B could have different masses and different velocities, but the same linear momentum vector, as long as the product of each mass and velocity is equal to the mass and velocity of the other object. But object A could have a smaller mass than object B, and likewise it could have a larger speed than object B. And if that was the case, both objects could have the exact same magnitude of their linear momentum, just the mass times the speed for both are equal to each other. But since linear momentum is a vector physical quantity, it has both magnitude and direction. And so this linear momentum vector to be the same for both has to have the magnitudes consistent with each other and also the directions. So just because two objects have the same magnitude of their linear momentum values, they need to have the same direction as well. So in order for the above statement to be true, both objects must be traveling in the same direction. That's why choice C is true. Choice D is not true because if we write the translational kinetic energy equation in terms of the magnitude of the linear momentum P squared, and divide that by two times the mass of the object. Both of our objects can have the same magnitude of linear momentum, but the object with the lighter mass is going to have a larger translational kinetic energy. So we're going to find out that in order for the linear momentum to be equal to each other for the two objects, they must be traveling in the same direction, but they don't necessarily have to have the same kinetic energy if they have two different masses. We can explore the connection between the work energy theorem and the impulse momentum theorem through the following slide. If a force external to a system represented by the vector F with the subscripts AB acts on a system, then that one force can do work on the system or it can create what's called an impulse. The definition of work done by an external force F is that we take that force vector and we dot it with the differential displacement vector DS that describes where the point of application of the, of the force is located on the system or on the object that we're looking at. That force vector can cause that point of application to undergo a displacement from an initial position S sub I to a final position S sub F. And as that force causes that displacement to occur, we say that force does work on the system. Well, that same force can act on the system over a certain amount of time. And the time over which that force acts, if the time begins at some time T sub I, 
and ends at some later time, T sub F, is going to create something called an impulse due to that force, as that force acts on the system over that time interval from Ti to Tf. Notice that in this integral, we're taking the product of that force vector with the differential dt, not the dot product, but just the regular multiplication product of this force vector with that differential dt. So what's created is a vector that's called the impulse that acts on the system. What's different about these two integral expressions is that the work done by that external force depends on the displacement over which that net external force acts. Whereas to determine the impulse that force creates on your system, that force is going to act on the system for a certain amount of time, and that time during which the force acts is going to create what we call impulse. So the expressions look similar, but the work expression involves displacement and the impulse expression involves time. The work energy theorem tells us that if we add together all the different work that's done by external forces on our system, we get the total work done on the system, then that total work has to change the energy of our system. The impulse momentum theorem says that those external forces give rise to a total net impulse that's applied to the system then that total net impulse can create a change in the momentum of the system. So both of these expressions are very, very powerful. They allow us to look at a system at some initial state. We see how it evolves to a final state. And knowing what happens in those initial and final states gives us a tool that we can use to analyze physics questions that don't require the use of Newton's laws of motion. What's also important to point out is that when this external force acts on a system and does work, the initial position of that force relative to where it's applied and the final position of that point of application are related to the times T sub i and T sub f during which that force acts. So when the force acts on a system related to some initial position vector Si, that force is beginning to act on that system at the time Ti, and as that system evolves to cause the point of application of the force to move to a new position defined by the position vector Sf, the time at which that point of application reaches that position Sf is gonna be the time Tf. So the initial and final states in both of those equations are related to each other. We want to study today a set of problems involving a bowling ball and a golf ball. And both of these balls are going to be undergoing pure translational motion. And in this particular example, big and small number one, they're going to have the same non-zero linear momentum. So the question we want to address in this problem is, which one of the balls has the larger translational kinetic energy? Will the bowling ball have more kinetic energy than the golf ball, or will they have the same, or is there not enough information to tell? Think about this, and we'll get back to you with the solution in the next video.